Good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Wendy Bohan with the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, and I'm going to talk to you tonight about using social media as a scientist. So it's always best to start the story at the beginning, right? So we're going to start thinking about this in terms of science communication. So science communication is the practice of informing, educating, sharing the wonder of science, raising awareness about science-related topics, but it has different components. There's always a communicator, which is the person that's doing the talking. That would be me in this situation. There's the audience, which are the people that are listening, and it's all happening on a platform. Right now, this platform is through a webinar. Uh, you may also be behind a podium. You could be on an airplane. Remember when we used to do that? So the platform is important for thinking about the kinds of communication that are going to work best. Importantly, real communication is bi-directional. I really, this kind of uh, communication where I'm just talking at you isn't the best way to communicate. We want to be able to uh, see the reactions of the people we're talking to and get some feedback from them. Importantly, all of these things are happening within a social, emotional, and physical context, like Everything that's happening around us is impacting the way we feel about what's being said. So what are some of the goals of science communication? This is from the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine report that came out in 2017. So they've identified five main goals. The first is to share the findings and excitement of science. That's one we always think about. We also want to increase appreciation for science as a way of navigating the world and understanding the world. We want to increase the knowledge of science related to a specific issue that requires a decision. This is often called science activation. So this is uh, something you would say, talk to policymakers about your science. Also, this sounds a little nefarious, but it's not. Uh, we can use science communication to influence people's opinions, behaviors, things like that. When the weight of evidence shows significant consequences, this would be something like wear masks during a pandemic uh, to help limit the spread of infection. Finally, we can use science communication to engage with diverse groups so that we can be sure that we're getting lots of different perspectives when we're considering and seeking solutions. So first, let's think about some of the challenges that we have as communicators when we're communicating science. So let's think about that for just a second. One of the things that comes to mind for me is that scientists get little or no communication training. And the training that we get in science writing, uh, giving talks, science communication is actually backwards uh, from good communication practices. So the usual communication from scientists, think about uh, the talks maybe that you've seen at GSA. We're expected to give the background, then we give methodology and supporting details, and we end by giving results and conclusions. Good communication practices outside of, say, uh, a scientific conference, you give the bottom line first. Why does it matter? So what? Who cares? And then you give all of the supporting details. Also, jargon. Jargon can be great, right? It's a shorthand for scientists to talk to each other, but outside of our small subdisciplines, that jargon can actually be really problematic. Uh, the sharing science team at AGU has uh, put together some really cute uh, examples of different kinds of jargon. So exa examples like fault. Most people outside of, say, tectonophysics wouldn't really think about fault in terms of earthquakes. They would think about fault in another way. The same with mean or modeling or shear. Also words like elucidate or utilize, these million dollar words that just complicate our speech, make us sound smart, we can probably do away with those things just to make our communication more understandable. So what are some challenges for the audience? Well, a lot of people have a lingering dislike of science from past experiences. Um, there's also a lack of familiarity with science. Most American adults don't take a science class after high school, so they may not have engaged with science in a really long time. Right now, in particular, there's a lack of trust in science and scientists. Also, our uh, influences, our values and beliefs, influence the way we feel about science. These can be psychological, political, societal, cultural, economic, moral, religious, institutional. Lots of different things play into how we feel about science and the way we interact with science. Additionally, the nature of science is just different than the way that human beings generally think, right? So the results in science are often ambiguous or uncertain. And Conclusions change with new data. They really do, and that can be hard for people to understand. So, for instance, this was from Twitter uh, maybe a week or two ago. Uh, they were saying, my concern is that we just keep making this up as we go along. The government needs to get a grip on our scientists. How can science change from one day to the next? 
And this is showing a fundamental misunderstanding that science is a, a process. It's not just a set of facts that are right or wrong, right? So we can use our communication to show the process of science. So now getting into social media, what exactly is social media? It's an internet-based application that allows, importantly, the creation and exchange of user-generated content. Now there's six different kinds of social media. We're going to concentrate on four kinds. Collaborative projects like Wikipedia. Uh, we're actually not going to talk about that, but we can talk about that during our uh, question and answers if anyone's interested. Uh, blogs and microblogs like Twitter. Content communities like Facebook and then social, uh, like YouTube and then social networking sites. Uh, like Facebook. So uh, email and instant messaging are actually considered technology. So let's see. This is an important thing, right? Social media is important because it's found everywhere. It's ubiquitous. There's almost 8 billion people in the world. Almost 5 billion of them are internet users and almost 4 billion of them are active social media users. So this is an opportunity for scientists to talk to people all across the world. So how much time do you think that uh, folks in the United States spend on social media? Now remember, that's not Google or Amazon, that's just social media like Facebook or Instagram, Twitter. Do you think it's more or less than the world average? So you might be surprised. The US spends about two hours a day on social media, which is about 20 minutes less than uh, the rest of the world, regardless, or the average of the world, regardless. People are on there, so we have an audience that we can uh, talk to about our science. So a few little facts about social media. I'm only going to go through Facebook and Twitter, but of course this goes along for Instagram and Snapchat and Pinterest. Uh, but Facebook, there's about uh, 2.4 billion monthly users and 1.4 billion daily users. If it were a country, it would be the largest country in the world. 53% of users check their accounts several times a day. One in five page views on the internet occurs on Facebook. And 48% of people uh, observing Lent said that they were fasting from technology. 16% specifically said they were abstaining from Facebook. Now, what about Twitter? There's about 326 million active monthly users. 24% of U.S. adults use Twitter, primarily uh, the demographic of ages 30 to 64. There's almost more than uh, 500 million tweets a day. There are 67 million U.S. users, 1 billion unique monthly visits to tweeted sites. 86% of users say they use this site to get news. And so how is social media actually being used by scientists? It's used to facilitate, network, and exchange knowledge within the scientific community, of course, and communicate general science and research to the public. And then, of course, like we're people, right? Scientists are people. So we use it for personal reasons to keep in touch with family and friends. But there's other things that scientists do. So it's used to uh, stay up to date on new science and breaking news. For instance, during the Kilauea eruption, everybody remember that? Um, the USGS volcanoes, Twitter and Facebook pages were just doing a fantastic job of keeping everyone up to date on what was happening. Not just the actual events, but the science behind them and all of the information about what could happen. So they were talking to the people in Hawaii on the ground that were being affected by the eruption. They were talking to the news media as well as to other scientists and the interested public. So they had a wide range of people that they were talking to and they were doing it in a very effective way. It can be used uh, to talk about ideas and events, get rapid feedback on developing ideas and you know, you can get invitations to present your work and collaborate on projects. I just did a talk the other day. Uh, someone found me through Twitter, which is amazing. So I have a few examples here on the bottom. For instance, here's two seismologists that are talking about a new paper that came out about the earthquake cycle. In the center here, there's a professor talking about um, subsidence in the Kilauea caldera. And then a member of the interested public asks a question, and then she answers them. These conversations are also happening on Facebook. For instance, there's a group called the Pacific Northwest Earthquake Discussion Group, which is made up of scientists and interested public talking about uh, geologic hazards and other issues for the Pacific Northwest. So this is just a really good way for scientists to come together and for people to come together with scientists to talk about things that are happening. We can use it for network and professional development, right? Especially this year when we're not going to conferences, we're not traveling as much. This gives us a really good way to stay up to date on what's happening 
uh, with conferences because we're not all there. We can follow the hashtags and figure out what's going on. So it's a good way to meet other people that are interested in what you're doing and just to keep up on the developments um, that are happening across the internet. I'm going to step up on my soapbox. You can't see me, but that's what I'm doing. Social media can be used to change the perception of science and scientists. So people have an idea of what science is, right? Uh, especially geology. People think, you know, we're out in the field wearing hiking boots, drinking beer. That's not, I mean, some people do that, but that's not the totality of geoscience. Sure, it's field work. It's also lab work. It's also conferences and writing. It's collaborations. Uh, we can also talk to people about the process of science. And as I said earlier, that's really important for people to understand. It's not just hypothesis, results, conclusion, right? It's ideas, challenges, observations, discoveries, wonder, excitement. You know, we can take the things that we love about what we do and really portray that to people so they get a full sense of what the scientific endeavor is about. And it can help to change the representation of scientists. You may have seen the article that came out in 2018 in the Washington Post when asked to draw a scientist, three out of 10 children drew a woman. So that's amazing. That's more than ever before, but it's still only three out of 10. So people still have the stereotype of scientists as older white men. And that's not true, right? We have lots of beautiful diversity in science and social media is a chance to highlight that. There's a lot of different groups and organizations that have found each other, especially on Twitter. So you can follow hashtags like Black and STEM, Vanguard and STEM, Girls Who Code, Disabled and STEM, Bi and Sci, Sci Mom. All of these different types of people that are doing science now have a voice and a platform. Uh, here's some groups that you can follow that are really interesting. And then there's a lot of uh, opportunities to join in initiatives, things like uh, still a scientist, or this is what a scientist looks like, to raise the visibility of certain groups in science. Additionally, social media can be used to cultivate communities of support. It can provide connection, community, mentoring, sponsorship, and advocacy. It's a low-cost, low-barrier engagement tool. Like we saw earlier, it's worldwide. It can increase structural diversity and representation, promote and bring awareness to intersectionality, reduce feelings of isolation for minority scientists and promote an increased sense of belonging and cultural wealth. I really love this quote from Montgomery, uh, 2018. She says, people are using digital spaces to intentionally cultivate communities to support the success of individuals who are underrepresented in particular spaces and in the academy as a whole. So moving on from that point, which I do think is one of the most important points, we can grow our influence. We can also find other people to work with. So this infographic on the left uh, is from a paper by Darling in 2015, where they talked to 116 marine scientists and looked at their Twitter accounts. So what they found is that the median Twitter following is 730 times larger than the mean university department size. So there may not be someone who does what you do in your university. There probably will be on Twitter. You can find them, talk to them, collaborate with them. Um, Retweets. So tweets linked to peer-reviewed PDFs are retweeted 19% of the time, which increases their dissemination and can actually increase the amount of attention that a paper gets, thereby, you know, increasing your citations. So, and it's not just we're talking to scientists. When they looked at the makeup of people's Twitter, uh, scientists' Twitter accounts, they found that 45% of followers were non-scientists, the media, and the general public. So people are interested in following scientists, hearing what they have to say. Also, if you're looking to do outreach or for your uh, broader impacts, social media can be a really good way to reach a lot of people. So a few years ago, uh, IRIS, UNAVCO, the USGS, and the Southern California Earthquake Center came together to do um, an AMA or an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, where we put up, you know, we had time and said, hey, come and ask us anything. People put up questions, and then we put up answers in real time. We spent about four to five hours answering questions, and we reached almost five million people. So in terms of cost benefit, it's a really good way to spend your time and reach a lot of people. So why should we use social media to discuss science? Why is it important? Well, 60% of American adults get their news from social media. These images are all from the Pew Research Center. Uh, a lot of people are getting um, their news from multiple social media sites, which is good, 
but half of Facebook news users get news only from that social media site. So we can't discount Facebook as um, an invalid tool for science communication because when people are getting information from Facebook, they're pretty much only getting it from Facebook. Additionally, uh, most Americans are relying on general news outlets for science news, but they really don't think they're getting the facts right about science. Now, the good news here is that one in six Americans are actively seeking out and consuming science news. But only about a quarter of social media users trust those platforms as a source of science news. So people are looking for science information, but they don't trust the media and they don't trust social media. So that brings up another important point. Does the public trust scientists? So let's think about that in terms of scientist and communicator credibility. So communicator credibility has two main components, expertise, and trust. In this case, that's the inferred motivation to be truthful or intent. Fisk and Dupree did a great study in 2014 in PNAS uh, where they asked a lot of different people about different types of careers and their thoughts about those careers. These are the words that were frequently associated with scientists. Smart, intelligent, disciplined, methodical, male. Uh, nowhere on there do you see the word trustworthy. So they made a graph of many of these different um, uh, these different jobs, and they, they put two axes, right? They had competence and warmth. So on the x-axis is competence, on the y-axis is warmth. So the ones that are down here on the bottom left-hand side are careers or jobs where a lot of people think that you don't have to be very competent to get that job, and also they don't really trust those people, right? They don't have a high level of warmth. On the other end of the spectrum, up here in the right upper corner, these are people that have to have a lot of competence to do what they do, and people understand their intentions. They think they have good intentions. They rank high on the warmth scale. These are teachers, nurses, doctors, child care workers, farmers. You know, what are the feelings those jobs inspire in you? Probably warm, happy feelings, right? These are the people we trust. Well, scientists and researchers are down in a different quadrant. Uh, we're, we're ranked there with accountants and CEOs and lawyers. People think that we need to be really competent to be good at what we do, but they don't really trust our intentions. So we have a lot of work there, and I would argue that social media will allow us to improve the public's conception and improve the trust of the public in scientists and researchers. And we can do that through social media. We're already on social media. 75 to 80 percent of academic researchers are already using social media, but scientists are only infrequently posting about science. And this is important because scientists, especially early career scientists, have social networks that are populated largely by non-scientists. And these networks are often ideologically and politically diverse. So this image is coming from the Bakshi study, and it's looking at people on Facebook. And the people, they rank themselves as liberals, moderates, or conservatives. That's on the right. And then their friends' designations are on the left-hand side. So you can see that those are pretty, pretty diverse, particularly for, for this period of time. So this is the part where everybody goes, oh, but I don't want to argue with people on the Internet. I don't either. But friends, we must. Because passive exposure to new information can actually change public perceptions and behaviors. Uh, researcher Karen Kirk is... She's doing the good work here, folks. She's going into the dark corners of Reddit, and she's looking to understand why people have their minds changed about scientific consensus and those sorts of things. So she was looking at a thread uh, on Reddit about people that used to think that climate change wasn't real, and now they've changed their mind. So one of the uh, people that she found, and I think this was a theme that was repeated, uh, this person said that repeated exposure to overwhelming evidence of climate change, partially thanks to persistent posters on Facebook, finally got through to me. So what she's learned from this is that facts do change people's minds, but not always, not immediately, not if they're irrelevant, not if they're from an unsavory source, again with the trust, and not if they're delivered with insults, right? We have to respect people. Being respectful is really important. So especially, especially when we're talking about contentious communication and social media. So there's a lot of things that are contentious uh, right about now. Um, and the way we've often approached some of these things is 
and, and not just contentious things, all the things, is using the deficit model. And the idea of the deficit model, it attributes public skepticism or hostility to science as a lack of understanding that results from a lack of information. So it implies that uh, the focus of communication should be on improving the transfer of information from experts to non-experts. But we know that the deficit model doesn't work. Particularly, it doesn't work around contentious issues like climate change, evolution, gender, diversity, inclusion, the shape and age of the earth, any of those conspiracy theories. So why? Why don't uh, just giving people more information, why doesn't that change their mind? It's because people make decisions based on their values and belief systems, particularly their religion and their political affiliation. So political and religious identity directly correlate with people's feelings and beliefs about stem cell research, the Big Bang, and evolution. Political identity correlates directly with climate change. So if we look at the uh, diagram on the right-hand side, you can see the things that are feeding into people's belief systems. And education or information is only one. Experience, mentors, cultures, faith, all of these things are feeding into the way that we're making decisions and what we value and what we think is real and true. So how then do we approach people and understand their values and belief systems so that we can communicate with them in a, in a better, more effective way? I think a way forward with this is looking at uh, behavioral psychology models, in particular, the elephant and the rider. And so this model basically says that we all have an emotional, automatic, irrational side, which we'll call the elephant. We all also have an analytical, controlled, rational side, which we'll call the rider. As scientists, man, we really love our rider, right? We like to think of ourselves as analytical, as logical, as evidence-based. But even in scientists, the rider is really small when you compare it with the elephant. So when was the last time you made a decision despite all of the facts and evidence, right? You made a different decision. We all do it. We all do it. So how can we use this information to help us communicate? First, we want to make sure we direct the rider, right? Give clear direction to reduce mental paralysis. That would be like saying, um, don't just say eat healthy, say eat more vegetables. Be specific. This is the part we've been missing, everyone. Motivate the elephant. Find the emotional connection. And we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. We also want to shape the path reduce obstacles, tweak the environment, make it easy for people uh, to, to listen, to really hear us. Nobody likes to be wrong. And so the way that we approach giving people information or challenging their beliefs is really important in whether or not uh, people are going to come to our side or dig in their heels in the boomerang effect. So perched atop the elephant, the rider holds the reins and seems to be the leader. But the rider's control is precarious because the rider is so small relative to the elephant. So what are some things we can do? Back to Karen Kirk. Do you want to be right or do you want to be heard? We have to connect with people. One of the ways that we can do this is through telling stories and listening to their stories. So first, listen. Listen to understand. I am the worst at that, right? I'm always thinking, what question can I ask next or, or thinking of other things. Really listen to what people are saying. Ask questions. Asking questions shows respect. It shows that you care about what they're thinking. You can respond without judgment and affirm the things that you can. Try and relate to people. Share values and experiences, not just information. Always, always be kind. Try and be understandable. Uh, as scientists, we love to acknowledge uncertainty. We love to talk about the uncertainty because when we talk to each other, that's how we know how certain we are. But when you're talking to uh, people that are part of the interested public, uncertainty has a very different meaning, right? Share personal stories and testimonials. Continue to provide information if that's possible because these small doses add up through time. Choosing your words thoughtfully can be really important. If you avoid charged terms and instead describe processes and evidence, you can keep people from digging in just on the basis of hearing the word, say, evolution. You can give them all of the data and information and leave out that word, and they're more likely to come along with you. So what about responding? That's a question I get a lot because of trolls, right? Nobody likes trolls. So not responding is an option. You are never required to engage. Your mental health is more important than any conversation you're ever going to have on Twitter. Protect it. And ask yourself if there's a benefit to responding. 
It gives you an opportunity to show unbiased responsiveness. Uh, you can provide a perspective that person may not have thought of, wh whether or not they're willing to admit it. Uh, you can learn about other people, which is really important if we want to understand. Uh, it could be a potentially productive conversation. Maybe not, but even if it's not, think about the people that are listening, right? Even if you're having a conversation with one people, well, one people, one person, lots of other people can listen into that conversation and you may change their minds. So focus on the fence sitters, the people who could be listening in. Always respond in a way that's going to build trust for yourself and other scientists and educators. We have to be aware that uh, most people don't know a living scientist. So if you are a scientist on social media, you may be the only scientist that people quote unquote know, right? So make sure that you are an outstanding example for the rest of us. When do you stop responding? When the conversation is no longer productive. And that's up to you, your your time, how much uh, energy and effort you want to put into it, kind of your motivation on that day. For me, I always try and give people the benefit of the doubt for the first few interactions because tone can be difficult to assess. Uh, so assume good intent. And once it's clear that the intent is not good, that's it. All right. So hopefully I've convinced you that you should be using social media. Now, how do you get started? First thing you want to do is allow one to two hours up front. So you have to choose a platform. You can uh, look at Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, WordPress, whatever. And these are all listed down here at the bottom. This is another sharing science uh, graph from, from AGU. You may already be using some of these, but just not posting about science. Maybe that's an easy in for you. Or you can think about what you're trying to do, right? Figure out who your audience is and what you're trying to talk to them about. And this will help you to do that. So if you want to talk to, say, high schoolers, you probably want to go on Instagram because that's the right demographic. If you have great videos to share, YouTube is the place for you. If you want to be uh, talking to uh, the the maybe over 65 demographic, Facebook is the place to go. So think about those sorts of things when you're thinking about where you want to start engaging on social media. So you allow an hour or two up front to set everything up, and then you can just maintain it over coffee breaks, which is what I do. I drink a lot of coffee, so I'm on the internet a lot, but you know, it's also kind of my job. So uh, after that, you want to spend, you know, one, once or twice a month, go through, look for new contacts, think about messaging, uh, sort of look back and see how things are going and do a, a just a general assessment. All right, so let's get started. First thing you want to think about, who is your audience? And think broadly. What is your objective? What is it that you want to do by sharing science on social media? Do you want to share your research? Are you trying to find new contacts? Are you trying to glow your, uh, grow your influence? Um, are you trying to give people more information? Are you trying to get people excited about science? All of these are valid objectives, and you can have more than one, of course. So let's get started. The first thing you want to do, determine your platform. Use a platform you already have, if that makes more sense. Find people to follow. Find organizations to follow. Might I suggest IRIS or UNAVCO, GSA. Jump into conversations. A lot of people will uh, lurk around or just kind of listen in. But really, it's great to just jump in and start talking. Your voice and your perspective is important, so share it. Also, make sure that you're amplifying others. Always amplify good content and make sure that you are amplifying people that maybe don't have uh, a voice in, in other areas. So social media is a great place to give people a platform. So what do you post, right? Now you've got everything set up and you're like, eh, I don't know what to say. Well, it's based on your audience and objective, and you're going to have to do some trial and error to find your unique voice, just like any other thing that you do. I would advocate for a mix of science and personal. Um, some people prefer to keep it all science, and that's absolutely legit, like totally fine. And we also have an opportunity here to build trust. And who are the people that we trust? The people that we know. Social media gives you a way to connect uh, with people in a new and different way. So we can know things like, you know, about celebrities. We know about their lives. We know what their living room looks like. We feel like we know them. Scientists, it can give people the opportunity to know scientists in a new way, to feel like they're friends with them, and then they're going to be more likely to trust. So how much do you share? I use the holiday party test personally. So you can be funny, you can be irreverent, you can be yourself, but you never want to be crass, you never want to be hateful, you never want to be vulgar. 
don't do anything or say anything on the internet that you wouldn't say at the office holiday party or at your neighborhood holiday party. So who do you trust? And this is a, a whole different talk, right? Figuring out who to trust, who to follow, who to amplify. Science organizations are a great place to start. NASA, USGS, NOAA, the National Park Service, IRIS and UNAVCO, of course, we're fabulous. University departments, anything funded by NSF, the major journals, and then you can see who those people follow and they're probably legitimate, right? Because these organizations spend a lot of time curating their social media feeds and they're not gonna follow people that are problematic. We always wanna think about our online etiquette. Think about creating a positive digital footprint and you know there are times to deviate from this but in general is it true is it helpful is it inspiring is it necessary is it kind uh, i also think about weight a lot why am i talking there's a lot of times on the internet where maybe we don't want to contribute maybe this conversation is for us to listen and learn and not to put in our perspective so it's important to keep that in mind oh i have a double slide here it's very important so you should Look at it again. So a few little Twitter tricks and tips, and we could do this for Instagram or Facebook as well. I just happened to choose uh, Twitter for this. Use keywords and hashtags. Hashtags is when you have the, the number sign in front of a word, and that basically just makes it easier to search. Uh, hashtags will double your engagement, but only use two or less. Otherwise, um, it decreases your engagement because it gets annoying. Use images. When you use images, there's a 150% increase in retweets. You can have 280 characters on Twitter, but if you keep it short and sweet, 110 characters or less, you get 17% more engagement. There's always um, a good time to post, right? So the best time to post is whenever you can, but there are peak times of engagement. So I have those listed here. I won't read them for you. Tweeting on Saturday and Sunday is important. People are not at work, so they're scrolling around. Doom scrolling is what we usually call it. You get 17% more engagement. Include links. Uh, there's 86% more retweets when you include links, but it's also important on the internet, as in life, to always give credit where credit is due. So if you can link to someone's paper, do that. If you can link to the website where you got information, do that. Don't you love this slide? Isn't it so fun? People love statistics. It gets more retweets. Understand Twitter trends and use them uh, to your advantage. So there's things like hashtag Monday motivation. Uh, I often use uh, Monday motivation to sneak in some earthquake preparedness, right? Like earthquakes happen this often in your state. Hashtag Monday motivation. Get your kit ready. So understand those trends and utilize them to engage with a different audience. Retweet the experts with your feedback because your voice and your perspective, as I said before, is important. You matter. What you have to say matters. Stagger your content, don't microburst. Sometimes people will sit down and write three or four tweets at once and send them out. Try and do it a couple of times a day, you know, with your coffee. You gotta have coffee in the morning, a little bit in the afternoon, keep you going maybe with, you know, a, a glass of whatever you wanna have at night. So, some of the benefits of using social media. Connecting with potential collaborators and mentors. Sharing your research. You could even uh, have an increase in citations. So there's a lot of research showing that if you uh, share your research online, you do get more citations. And I'm happy to provide those references for people. You can learn about research outside of your field. There's so much amazing stuff happening in the world. It's so hard to keep track of everything. And Twitter is a good way to curate things so that you can see a lot of really wonderful things you may not have known about before. It's really good for broader impacts. So if you're working on uh, an NSF grant or some kind of proposal where you need to do broader impacts, please consider social media because it's a great way to reach a lot of people. It can help improve science communication. It can improve general science literacy. And, you know, it really gives people an appreciation for the scope and the value of science. We know science is important, and if we can communicate our passion about science, our love of science, the excitement that goes along with that, we can really get people to appreciate it with us. And again, the humanization of scientists, I think, is critical um, for building trust. And that trust is really what's going to uh, get everybody working together to solve today's truly important global problems. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate you sticking with me till the end. And here's my contact information if you need me 
uh, my email, uh, bohan at iris.edu, my website, my employer's website, www.iris.edu. And of course, you can find me on social media at Dr. Wendy Rocks. So thank you, everyone. And uh, take good care of yourself and everybody else. Many do so daily. And 83% of world leaders are on Twitter.